So the crux of this series, This Is My Testimony, is all about we sharing our story, sharing our testimony of the work that God is doing in our lives, the good work that God continues to do in our lives, the ways that he has been faithful and he continues to be faithful. There is power in us testifying, sharing of who God is and what he has done. And what, um, what this is doing in us as our church goes through this rooted experience together, many of you are in groups and you're weekly, you're doing homework and devotionals and meetings together and talking about it, is that it's developing these rhythms of being like Jesus and becoming like Jesus. But at the same time, it's also encouraging us as we hear other people around us sharing the work that God is doing in our life. And as a reminder, these rhythms that we're talking about, these seven rhythms of someone who's being like Jesus, who's becoming like Jesus, who's growing in relationship with Jesus are up on the screen. We're talking about rhythms of daily devotion and prayer, spending time reading God's word and meditating on it, talking with him repentance and freedom from strongholds, this desire to say no to sin, yes to what Christ has for me, sharing our story, sacrificial generosity, serving the community. These things are outward focus of how God is impacting us and how we can be a blessing towards others. And then what we, what we do here, what we do in every aspect of our life, we worship, we declare God's goodness, his amazing love in our lives, whether it's through song, whether it's through how we live, whether it's how we interact with other people. These are consistent rhythms, consistent patterns of people who are following Jesus. And Root is helping us do that. But the one thing that we're, we're seeing, and we've seen for many, many years, is that there is someone out there who doesn't want us to do this. There is someone who is going against us time and time again. Anytime we take a little step forward to become like Jesus, anytime we try to develop these rhythms, anytime we try to testify or share about how God is working in our lives, there's always someone who doesn't want us to do that. And that someone is Satan. And Jesus is very clear about who he is in Scripture. In John chapter 10, verse 10, this is what Jesus says. He says, the thief, that's Satan, He comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I've come that they, that's you and I, may have life and have it to the full. Satan does not want us to experience this new life in Jesus Christ that we talk about here at Avenue, that that God's word talks about, of being a disciple, a follower of Jesus. And so as we continue in this series, we need to take a moment to talk about our main adversary, the one who opposes us consistently. And so we're going to answer a few questions about Satan this morning. And the first question is this, is, well, who is he? <laughs> who is he? We have a lot of cultural pictures. And even around Halloween, we begin to think about who Satan is. And I, I threw a few up on the screen, throw that first one. You have these pictures that a lot of times you hear in scripture and, and people have made statues or images of it uh, over time because of things that they've read that we'll, we'll read in just a moment. So you have that picture of it. You also have the cartoon pictures of it. And it's like, I don't know where he got a goatee from, but I think it's just because it matches his ears a little bit, and that's why they just kind of added it to it. I don't know if they just need more black on the red. I'm not really sure. Then you have, in one of my favorite Disney movies, Emperor's New Groove, you have this picture all the time of like, you have Satan on one shoulder, you have an angel on the other shoulder, one's telling you bad, one's telling you good. You're trying to figure out what to do and what decision to make. It's like your conscience, and a lot of times we think of it in that way. And then just within our culture, we just have this idea of, of a devil that kind of loses its flavor, loses its punch. Um, these, uh, this is the picture of the mascot, the logo of Hinsdale Central, right down the street, 10, 10 seconds away. And there's multiple schools, there's multiple sports teams. They, they have, you know, they're the demon deacons or they're the, the red devils or whatever it is, or the blue devils. Like we just, it's just a part of our culture, this, this picture of Satan. And we, as humans, like to put physical descriptions in order for something to feel tangible that doesn't have really a physical nature to it. And with Satan, that's, that's the case. Is that he's a spirit. He, he's, not a, he's not an actual figure. He's not a cartoon. He's, he's a spirit. In fact, he is a fallen angel. And we're going to see here in Scripture in just a moment that Satan used to be an angel in heaven before the creation of the world. His name was Lucifer. He was, oh, it's a word that means bringer of light. 
He was a son of light. And so he was one of God's top archangels and he got prideful and wanted to then overtake God's power, overtake God's authority. And God said, no, that's not gonna happen. And he cast them out of heaven. And so these couple of scriptures I'm gonna read tell us this picture, give us this story, first in the book of Revelation and then in the book of Isaiah. They both give us depictions of what happened before the earth was created. So Revelation chapter 12, starting in verse one, I'm gonna read a little bit and give some commentary on it. It starts this way, it says, a great sign appeared in heaven. So this is the apostle John. He is listening to, the, or he's, he's getting this vision from the Lord. He says this, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. Stop right there. That woman is a, this is all analogy, this is all metaphorical. That woman with the 12 stars, it represents the nation of Israel, all right? So the woman, nation of Israel, 12 stars, we know they had 12 tribes in Israel. So the woman here is the nation of Israel. Throughout the Old Testament, you hear about Israel referred to as the mother or the woman. Um, prophets refer to the whole nation of Israel in that way. It's just a common way that Israel is described in this metaphorical language. So we have Israel there. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. That's verse two. Stop right there for a moment. Who's she about to give birth to? It's metaphorically speaking, she's bringing the Messiah, the Savior, Jesus Christ into this world. We know that Jesus was Jewish in heritage. He was Jewish in his culture. He was born into a Jewish family. And throughout the Old Testament, we know that the Messiah, the Savior, would come from Israel would come from the, the, the town of David, the city of Bethlehem. That's the Savior, Christ the Lord. We've seen that all the time during Christmas. So the mother, Israel, is bringing forth the Savior, Jesus. And thankfully, even though we're not Jewish or of Israel descent, we can have relationship with Jesus by faith in his death and resurrection because Jesus was not just the Messiah for the Jews, the Savior for the Jews. He's the Savior for the entire world. Verse 3. Then another sign appeared in heaven. An enormous red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns on its head. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might devour her child the moment he was born. We stop right there again, verses three and four. Now we get this picture of Satan. You know why we have some of these cartoons and these images and these statues of who he is. And it, you know, it says there in verse four that he swept a third of the stars out of heaven. So we know that Satan, Lucifer, he's a bringer of light. Light is always a way of declaring God's goodness and God's glory to those around us. So the stars here are representative of the third of the angels that came with Satan and tried to overthrow God's authority. So today, however many angels there were before the creation of the world, two thirds of them are good and are still working to de declare God's goodness and bring his light and encourage and strengthen and protect us. But a third of them have followed Satan. And a third of them we would know as demons. And we read about demons and we'll talk about that a little bit here throughout um, our time together this morning. And so those are the third of the stars. Those are now demons, fallen angels, just like Satan is a fallen angel. You didn't know you were gonna get into all this this morning, did you? All right, verse five, we got some, we got some ground to cover. She gave birth to a son, that's Jesus, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. That's a prophecy in the book of Psalms that points to the future Messiah, that's Jesus. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. It's a picture of his death, his resurrection, and his ascension, where he rules and reigns and will return someday. The woman fled into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. I don't have time to get into all of these different things, but we'll come back to that one in just a little bit, but not dive too deep into it. Verse 7. Now we get this picture of what happened before the foundations of the world. It kind of goes back and forth. It's a, it's a present, past, future. It goes all back and forth here in these 11 verses. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. And the dragon, Michael, archangel, by the way, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So I'm not just making this up. John gives us the context. He says, 
this is what I saw in my mind. This is what the Lord revealed to me. Here's exactly what it means. Your pastor's not just saying random stuff this morning. All he's doing is reading this. So we have this picture of what took place before the foundations of the world, the plan that God was initiating to save humanity from, from our sins, to send his son Jesus. But then verse 10 and 11 is a verse that we started this series with. It's a verse that we uh, have sung quite a few times in This Is My Testimony, a song we've sung quite a bit in the series. Verse 10, then I heard a loud voice in heaven say this, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. So now we get this picture of us partnering with the power that comes from Jesus' death and resurrection in our lives, that when we testify, we have power over Satan. When we declare God's goodness and his rule and reign in our lives, when we, when we declare that Jesus' death and resurrection is what saves us and redeems us and his spirit gives us the power and strength to move forward, we then have power over Satan. We have power over the demonic forces against us who are actively opposing us. That's why when we, when we study God's word, when we pray, when we align ourselves with God's heart, when we listen to him and declare those things in our life and share that with other people, there's power in our words. Not because we're so powerful, but because of what we are declaring. And it has power over Satan and his forces. Now I had planned to share all that, but I'm gonna take a 60 second detour if you'll let me um, and go back to, to verse 7 there, if you want to fill that back up on the screen, Sue, verse 7 of Revelation chapter 12, because, or I'm sorry, verse 6, go back verse 6, sorry about that. So verse 6, the woman fled, remember the woman's Israel, into the wilderness to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care for 1260 days. So that concept of the wilderness in scripture, we know the Israelites were led in the wilderness for a season and they had to go through some difficult circumstances. The wilderness is always a time of, of suffering that brings about good. It brings about God's greater glory. It brings about our development and our dependence on God. You know, what we've seen take place in our world these last couple days with the attacks on Israel and what we've seen over time of how the Israelite people and the country of Israel have kind of been, uh, had a lot of evil atrocities against them. I, I'm not here to make a political stance or a political statement this morning, but we do know a couple things from scripture that number one, that the people of Israel have a special place in God's heart. I don't understand that full dynamic. There are people who are smarter than me, that have read the Bible more than me, that understand the Hebrew language and can read it and can write it and understand everything in the Old Testament. They even differentiate on their opinion of how God is working or should be working with the nation of Israel today. So I, I don't know fully how that looks, but I do know this, is that the Israelites have a special place in God's heart and that God has used this people group over time. And as we see here, they, they will experience difficulties, hardships, pain, suffering, because why? Because the enemy is against them. Satan is actively opposing Israel. And I don't understand the full complexities of that. I don't understand how that works. You know, because sometimes in our mind, it's like, well, now Jesus, he's the Messiah, he's the Savior, he came from Israel. Why is Satan still go after his people? I'm not, I don't understand all of that. And there's a theological debate. There's 16 other sermons I could probably preach on just that topic that we don't have time to get into today. But I'm not surprised when these things happen. And it's sad to see these things happen. But what's also sad is that we have Jewish brothers and sisters that still are waiting for the Messiah. And so our response as Christians, not only do we want peace, not only do we want protection, not only do we not want to see these wars take place and the complexities of war and how that aligns with our view as Christians, that's another 16 sermons for a different Sunday, right? But all that to say is this, is that our hearts should be drawn that, that when they go through the wilderness, the 1260 a lot of times, anything with a thousand attached to it doesn't mean the exact number. A lot of times it can just mean, metaphorically, just means a long period of time. We don't know how long that is. Is that what does it do, the wilderness? 
Well, it draws you into who God is. It draws you into how he's revealed himself. And so when we see these things happen, may our hearts as Christians be praying that they would be drawn to see Jesus as their Messiah, that he really is the savior, not only for them, but for the entire world, that the the Old Testament scriptures that they know and they celebrate and they understand, may may God burn in their hearts, may his Holy Spirit awaken them a knowledge and understanding that, wait a second, this does point to Jesus, that he is the savior, that he is the Messiah. So believe that in the midst of this this suffering, this terrible things that have just taken place these last couple days, that it would draw people to Christ, just like we talked about last week when it comes to suffering. No matter what suffering we go through, that we want people to be drawn to Christ in the midst of it. So there was my 60 second, more probably like 120 second detour about, about this passage and what we're going through, okay? So now going to Isaiah, we get a little bit more of a picture of what happens here with Satan in the fall before. So Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 says this, How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. Other translations of scripture, that's where you see that word Lucifer at. And that word Lucifer means morning star, son of the dawn. He's a bringer of light. Those stars, a lot of times, metaphorically, as we saw, are used to describe angels, the messengers of light, the ones who declare who God is to those around us. Verse 13, Or it says, you've been cast down to the earth. You once laid low the heavens, the nations. Verse 13, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of Mount Zephon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. That's Lucifer. He's doing all of that. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. And so that this, is, this is what we see take place before the creation of the world. That Satan wanted to become God. God said, no, that's not your role. It's not your job. I created you and you are called to worship me. And he took a third of the angels. And now we have this spiritual battle going on around us in which the fallen angels led by Satan, Lucifer, are actively opposing us who are following God, who are following Jesus. And so we know who Satan is. We know where he came from. So what does he actually do then? If he's actively opposing us, as he's going against us, what is he actually doing in our lives? Three quick things we're going to see. Number one is this, is that he deceives. Satan is a deceiver. He's the father of all lies. He twists the truth. We see this in Genesis chapter three in the garden where he tells Adam and Eve, hey, did God really say that you can't eat the fruit? He twists the truth. He deceives. And in John chapter 8, 44, we also see that um, he's, Jesus said he's the father of all lives. And, and what I really appreciate is what Paul has to say, Ephesians chapter 6 and verses 10 through 20. We'll read a few of these verses today. Um, some of you will dive deeper into this in your rooted experience this week. Ephesians 6 says this, verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power, put on the full armor of God, So you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. He's actively trying to deceive us. He's actively trying to um, go against us in this way. He's trying to make things more difficult for us to follow Christ, to follow Jesus. That's the first thing he does. The second thing he does is this, is that he destroys. He, He just, he is, he is allowed within the sovereignty of God within this world to bring destruction and chaos and pain into this world. He has that freedom. He has that power right now, and he does that. We see that in the book of Job, in the story of Job. God allowed him to destroy basically all of Job's family, all of his possessions, to destroy his skin, to bring harm and pain on him. He he was allowed to do that. And in the New Testament, you read these different stories that we don't really like to preach about because about Jesus because they're kind of hard to talk about. But we see Jesus cast out demons quite often. So devil, his demons, they're able to go into people. They're able to destroy them, physically harm them, make their life miserable, make the family's life miserable around them. But we see that Jesus still has power over them, but they still have this habit and this pathway of destruction that God has not taken care of once and for all just yet. He will someday, but he hasn't in this time frame. And so in Matthew chapter 8, 28, verse 32, we see even Jesus 
have this interaction and we see the destruction that these demonic forces have on people. Verse 28, when he, Jesus, arrived at the other side in the region of the Gerardines, two demon-possessed men were coming from the tombs. They met him and they were so violent that no one could pass that way. What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted at Jesus. Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? See, they, the demons even know that their time is limited, that one day they will be defeated once and for all. Verse 30, some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, send us into the herd of pigs. And so he said to them, go. And so these demons came out of the men and they went into the pigs and the whole herd then rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Demons create chaos and destruction. They bring harm not only to these two men, but to the, this herd of pigs. And right now within the, the sovereignty and plan of God, Satan and his demons have not been fully defeated. And so they're allowed to roam. They're allowed to bring destruction here on this earth. And the last one is that Satan, he distracts. He distracts us. And this is probably the one that's most prevalent in our culture today. We see this in, the, in, in when Jesus was led into the wilderness, he was tempted by Satan multiple times. And he was saying, hey, I know you're about to prepare for your three years of ministry. You're about to go to the cross. You're about to die and rise again. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna end it once and for all. It's not, I have no chance after that. Like, this is not gonna be good for me. So Satan, he tried to distract him. Hey, I know you're hungry. So how about you turn that, into, that stone into bread? Hey, look, I could give you everything in the kingdom right now. Just, just, just bow down and worship me. Hey, show, show me. He's trying to get him off his mission, off, foc not focus on what he's called to do. And so often, that's where we find ourselves, is that we're distracted by the worries and the cares of this world. We're distracted by the, the pleasures and the, the entertainments and the, and the good blessings that God gives us to enjoy. But we get so focused on the blessing, not the one who blesses, and we get distracted from what he's called us to do. Or we live in a culture that, that doesn't like suffering, that doesn't like pain. And so we try to do everything we can to not experience difficult things in our lives. But we know that suffering is a, is a good thing for us. It grows us and makes us more like Christ. So Satan, he distracts us from our mission. He distracts us of living out the great commission of making disciples and being a disciple, a follower of Jesus. So we know who Satan is. We know what he does against us. And after hearing some of those things, we may have this picture of him as having this great amount of power. His demons is having so much power over us and around us. And there is some truth in the fact that they are powerful. But we also can't forget what he says, what the Apostle John says in his word. First John 4, 4, it, it says this. Maybe you've heard this verse before um, read to you. It says, you dear children are far from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Jesus is saying, hey, John is saying, hey, the Holy Spirit inside of you is more powerful, is greater than Satan and his demonic forces. Like we have God's spirit in us, so we have the power and the strength to overcome, to not be distracted, to not be deceived, to not be destroyed. Like we, we have the power and the strength to overcome. Like he opposes us, but he can't control us. He's powerful, but he's not so powerful that we succumb to him. And, and maybe you heard a little bit of this in Megan's testimony last week. Uh, Megan Bauer, she shared her story of the work that God's doing in her life and how God has saved her and redeemed her. But Megan shared a lot about some of the things that she experienced before Christ and their demonic activity that she was a part of. You see, we can make ourselves susceptible to those things when we engage in those things, when we listen, when we practice those things. And like I said, if you haven't heard Megan's testimony, go to our website, YouTube page, whatever it is. You can listen to it, listen within the service, sermon, whatever it is. I sent down the email on Friday as well. You can hear it. And she talks about these things, that she was controlled by these things, whether it was witchcraft or fortune tellers. We use Ouija boards, different things like that, that, that invoke the demonic activity around us. That's real. It is powerful. Now, is the Holy Spirit inside of us more powerful? Yes. 
When, when Megan was laying there, almost overdosed, laying there in the hospital bed, she cried out to Jesus and, and, and said, I need you. If you're real, Lord, show me. Is he more? Absolutely, he's more powerful than Satan. That's why her life has changed. That's why it's been redeemed. But so many times, we like to dabble in these things that, oh, it's not that big of a deal, or it's fine, or, uh, you know, it's not going to have a control over me. But what we're doing is we're making the battle more difficult for ourselves. We, we try to train in these habits of knowing Christ and becoming more like him, but then we also feed ourselves with these other things, this demonic activity around us. And that begins to grow in us. It's like if you're going on a diet and you're like, I need to start eating healthy. And you're like, well, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat more fruit, more vegetables. So you have an apple a day and you have a leaf of spinach a day. Like you're on the right track. That's good. But then every night for dinner, you eat a full Little Caesars pizza, a pint of Ben and Jerry's. You have some chips before bed. And you're like, wait, why am I not losing weight? I've changed my diet. I eat a fruit and a spinach leaf every day. Why is this not working? Well, because you keep putting the other stuff in you. See, it doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit's not working in your life, but if you're not strengthening that relationship, you're not becoming more dependent on him through these rhythms that we're talking about, and you're feeding yourself with these other things, that's going to grow and grow and grow inside of you. Now, at any point, can faith be the catalyst to break those things? Absolutely, like we saw in Megan's story. But we also have a responsibility to, to grow it through the power of his spirit working in our lives. And so when we think about Satan, our relationship with him is, is unique. Yes, he opposes us. It is a spiritual battle that's going on. But what does our relationship look like with him? Because sometimes we, we have two different thoughts. I think it's on two different sides of the pendulum. Go throw that, one, that, that picture up on the screen. So the pendulum, you know, it goes back and forth. And sometimes we're on, we're on this blue side. Satan in me. It's my sinful nature. It's my sinful desires. And as long as I just pray and read and, and just go to church and I do these things, well, then I just got to fight Satan in me. You know, it's just my sinful desires, sinful habits. If I say no to all those terrible things, no to the pizza and the ice cream, and I'm not going to open myself up to it, I'm going to eat my fruit and veggies, like, then I'm going to be good. Then I'm going to follow him. And we only focus on Satan within. And then we have the other side of the pendulum, which is like, well, he's Satan's all around. And I got a flat tire. The devil's after me. I got stunned by a bee. The devil is attacking me. You know, my kid is not listening. He, he's testing my patience. Oh, the devil's in my house. I got to pray the devil out of my house right now. And it's like we, we, we blame everything on the devil or we say, well, it's just, it's just the devil in me. It's the sin in me and the demonic activity I'm not concerned about because greater is he who is in the world or greater is he who is in me that is greater in the world. Like, I'm good. I, I don't need to worry about that stuff. Or it's all around. It's everywhere. And, and I don't take any personal ownership. It's like, oh, I got this difficult relationship that's happening at work and there's some tension in that relationship and well Satan must be attacking me he's opposed to me or that person's coming after me because they're filled with Satan it's like well no you need to do a better job of conflict resolution like you need to learn some skills so that you can articulate how you feel and it's not just because that person's full of Satan or Satan's coming after you like there needs to be this balance that yes we are born sinful and there is a battle within with the Holy Spirit and our sinful nature Satan in us, yes, that, that is very true. But there's also things that are outside of our circumstances, things that we can't see in the spiritual realm. But there is a battle going on. There is something that's happening. Paul writes about this in Ephesians 6, 12. I've told you to be back there a couple times. Verse 12 then says this, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Like there is a battle going on. There are things that we can't see and when Satan and his, his demons are actively opposing us. And some of that happens within our own hearts and some of that happens in circumstances around us. But when we are serious about pursuing Jesus, following Jesus, developing these rhythms, these habits in our life to, to know him and grow closer to him, we're going to face opposition. 
It's like you want to, it's like you're feeling discouraged and sad or angry about something. And all of a sudden that, that one temptation, that one vice that you have, it just shows up on a commercial, you know, on the TV. And you're just like, how did that come up when I knew I was feeling this? And that's sometimes what I do to, to deal with, you know, my pain and suffering. Instead of dealing with it head on, I just take it out on the vice. And how did that commercial just come up in that moment? It was a little bit of both there, right? Like it's not a surprise that that happened, yet at the same time, there's still that battle within because there's been different things you've experienced over the years that led you to that place that you need to work through and grow into. And so that's, and that's what I want to talk about for the rest of our time this morning, for the last few minutes I have, is how do we then battle? How do we actively oppose and how do we go against what, what Satan is trying to do to us, what his demonic forces are trying to do against us? Like, how do we tap into that power source that we have, which is the Holy Spirit? And some of you will be doing that this week in your root experience. We, we're going to practice repentance or these freedom from strongholds. These sins that are in our hearts that also seem to be all around us and lead us to those places of not following Jesus, but following our own selfish desires. These are the things that we have to work on. These things that we have to grow into. But in order for us to take that first step of battling, we have to be able to identify it not only in our mind, but to testify about it, to confess it, to share it with those around us. That's why I said this week, some of you are going to be doing that in your rooted experience. You're going to be going around saying, hey, this is the struggle, this is the sin, this is the difficulty I consistently have to fight against. Some days are better than others. But I want to confess this and share this and be prayed over by other people and have people read God's word over me so that I know God's word, understand God's word, and can use God's word as a weapon against it. That's why armor of God, Ephesians 6, 13 through 20, something to read for for everyone's homework today. Just go back and read it and you see how we fight that spiritual battle by doing different things that God has called us to do, like know scripture and pray certain ways and, and to arm ourselves with truth and, and to testify to, to who God is and, and his, his good news in our life. But we have to do this. We have to share this with those around us. The, the James, the brother of Jesus, he, he says this in chapter 5 or 16 of his letter. He says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. You see, in the same way, when we testify to God's goodness in our life, we share our story, there's power in it. When we confess what's going on in our life, when we testify and say, hey, this is my struggle, this is my shortcoming, these are the things I'm working through and, and can't get over, when we share that with other people around us, they begin to pray for us. And true spiritual healing can take place. Freedom from these sins can take place. You can begin this journey of consistently overcoming whatever is hindering your relationship with Jesus and being more like him. So how, how does this practically play out? Well, he, here, here's two verses that I've seen over these last seven years that brought to light not only the Satan in me, but also the, the Satan around me. Ephesians chapter four, verses 26 through 27. Maybe you've memorized this or seen these verses before. It says this, Paul writes, in your anger, do not sin. Full stop, that's a great one. You could just memorize that. You'd be good for today, Right? Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. Don't let him have a foothold. Don't let him have a stronghold. Don't give him that opportunity. Don't, don't keep feeding yourself with the pizza and the ice cream. Like, don't do it. Don't allow him to do that. So in your anger, do not sin. Well, obviously, when we, when we grow up as kids, and especially little ones, we all are in this phase of throwing temper tantrums. Right? We don't get our way, and so we stomp and we cry and we don't get what we want. That the anger's within. That's not how you handle your anger. Just because you didn't get ice cream for the third night in a row doesn't mean you get to throw a temper tantrum, right? Okay? And I'm talking a lot about ice cream. Probably have to have some later today. Um, and then as you get older, those preteen years, those teenage years, you, you, you develop and you grow that defiance <laughs> to authority. 
and you just don't want to listen or you're just irritable about everything and your parents say one word and you're like, oh, oh, my parent. And you just, you kind of lose, and you're just like, what happened to my sweet child? It's like, oh, they hit 13. That's what happened, you know? It's like, it, and so sometimes we say it's hormones, whatever it is, but like we see this anger and frustration because we're feeling that things aren't as they should be. We're feeling injustice in our lives. And then we kind of begin to work on that and grow in that and we don't throw temper tantrums as much anymore. And, but then there's things around us that still draw that out in our lives. And so for me, it was, it was six years ago. It was when I, when I was fired from a position at a church and I just got really angry and it got really bitter. And, and people around me couldn't see it, but I began to be more irritable at home, lacking patience. And then, you know, over the next couple of years, I wasn't really dealing with it. I wasn't sharing that with other people, even though my wife could see it. <laughs> and, and, and so then I, I, you know, there's transitions that happened here at our church in 2019. And I would take my work frustrations home and, and take it out and just not be patient with other people. And, and then 2020 happened and I became the senior pastor and then COVID hit and all the different things and things kept going on and on. And then we have personal losses and, and, and tragedies and grief and overwhelming feelings, relationships that are broken, these things that are out of my control that I can't do anything about, but all it does is keep swelling up this anger inside of me. And so I wouldn't lose it with other people. But then all of a sudden it's like that, that teapot that's on the stove, it's just, you hear it, you hear it, and then it just, you know, shoots off the steam, and there'd be spilled milk on the ground, and I'd be like, no, or Max, how could you spill the milk? And Maria's like, who, what? It's spilled milk. Like, why is that reaction <laughs> for something like this? It's because I allowed Satan to take that stronghold of anger in my heart. And so it was around probably two years ago I began talking with people about it and asking for prayer about it, meeting with counseling, counselors about it, talking with different people here in our church about it. You know, Ed, I met with you a couple times for coffee and you called me out on it. I don't like you for that, but you had to. You know, I've, I've had to do that in my small group, in my life group. I've shared that with staff. I've shared that from this stage a couple times. Am, am I perfect? No. But is it, am I growing? Yes. Do I still have those spilled milk, milk moments? Yes because I don't do a good job of just sharing how I'm feeling and, and displaying with those around me why I'm frustrated, discouraged, whatever it is. Maybe it wasn't spilled milk, but it was this past Wednesday night, it was cherry bubbly that got, it spilled. And, and there it was again, you know? And so is it a work in progress? Absolutely. But the reason that it's a work in progress is because I've had to share that and ask for prayer, and ask for encouragement, and ask for accountability, and, and allow people to speak into my life to say, hey, Kyle, when you're angry and frustrated, yeah, that, that's because you're a sinner, <laughs> and you're in need of a savior, and there's a battle going on. And yes, it's, you've experienced a lot of difficult things, just like everyone else has experienced a lot of difficult things in their life. But in order for you to experience healing and power and authority over Satan, you got to share that with people. You got to receive prayer and healing. You got to allow God's word to soak into your life. But know that Satan's going to keep coming after you. Just like he's coming after all of us. So that was a lot to take in this morning. I get that. And if you're sitting here this morning, it can feel overwhelming. You can feel discouraged and a message about Satan. But right now, as we move into a time of communion, we get to reflect on why we are confident and hopeful in the victory over Satan, his power, and his schemes. It's because of Jesus. It's because of his death and resurrection. It's because of the grace that he's willing to show a sinner like me who, who gets too frustrated with his kids sometimes over small things or gets irritated with his wife or coworkers about things that aren't that big of a deal or who, who thinks things and maybe doesn't say it out loud but is like, oh, that person really made me mad in that moment. And doesn't say made me mad in that moment in his mind either, right? Like, like we're a work in progress. I'm so grateful that 2,000 years ago when Jesus came to this earth, he lived a perfect life, he died and rose again, that he knew, Kyle, you're gonna be in a battle. Everyone else is gonna be a battle. And I'm still going to the cross. I'm still giving up my life for you. I'm still dying and rising again and coming back for you someday. Like the cross is the encouragement for us today. 
His resurrection is the thing that gives us hope for today, that no matter what it is that you're going through, no matter what attacks you're feeling, no matter the, the impact or not impact, whatever it is that you are still working through, feel like there's a sin or a struggle in your own heart, because of the cross, because of his resurrection, we have hope, we have power, we have strength that only come through Jesus. And so in a moment, one of our elders, Sam Brooks, is gonna lead us in taking communion together. But I wanna just create a silent moment here for just a a few seconds and ask God, God, is there anything inside of me that I need to confess to you today? Let us start with this individual confession that we do weekly, but may it also propel us into sharing this with others, to getting the help and encouragement and the prayer that we need. But let it start here. Let God's spirit through God's word speak to us and convict us and help us to fight the battle. Because when we testify to who God is, we confess to what is not of God in our hearts. There is power and authority and strength over the one who opposes us. And there's power and authority and strength to see more people be transformed by Jesus because of your testimony and your confession. And so let us take right now a moment. Let's talk to God. The thoughts that we're thinking, he hears those in our mind. And then I'm gonna pray, and then Sam will lead us in taking communion together. So let's talk to the Lord right now. Jesus, I'm just, um, I'm grateful for how much you love us. How you, you are for us and not against us. And I pray for just anyone who's feeling discouraged right now or distraught or overwhelmed, God, would you just show them today that because of who you are and what you've done, they have power to overcome. We claim that truth. We claim that promise in scripture that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. We hold firm to that today. Thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you for forgiving us of our sins. Thank you for giving us the strength through your spirit in our lives to say no to sin and yes to you. Would you protect us? Would you show us and make us so aware of the attacks of the enemy around us today in our own lives and and around us, Lord? We humble ourselves before you. We need you. We can't do this on our own, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your death and your resurrection. We celebrate that now as we communion with you, Jesus. We ask this in your name. Amen.